Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of the Animal Liberation Hour, where we seek insight from animal rights and liberation activists around the world so that we can think, reflect, learn, and be inspired. Today, we have a very special guest, my friend Dosh from Kampala, Uganda. He's the founder of the Paderska Foundation, who helps animals and human animals. I'm so excited for you all to listen to this episode and be inspired by Dosh because he just does it all. Everything from teaching in classrooms to doing controversial and intense uh, actions and demonstrations uh, in, you know, within his community. So I'm very excited for you to hear about all this, but Before we get into the episode, I want to remind you that the Animal Liberation Hour is a project of animal activism mentorship. AAM is a free multinational program that helps aspiring animal rights activists as well as those who are already activists but want to take their activism to the next level. From one-on-one mentorship to free workshops and trainings to this podcast, AAM seeks to empower humans to fight for animals so that the world will have more activists and we can achieve liberation sooner. For more information, visit AnimalActivismMentorship.com and follow AAM on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship. You can keep up with the Animal Liberation Hour on AAM's social media as well. Animal Activism Mentorship is fueled by FARM, FARM Animal Rights Movement. So I hope that you will enjoy this discussion with Dosh as much as I did. I have to admit, at the time of recording, uh, we had a really bad internet connection, and I probably only picked up about 30% of what he was saying like in the moment. So if some of my follow-up questions are weird or something like that, that's why over the internet connection I could barely make out what he was saying sometimes, but we had him record on a separate device and email that to me later. So when I edited this uh, episode and went back through and listened to all of his answers and was fully able to hear everything, I thought, oh man, I would have asked him a follow-up question about this if I had heard that and all of that. But uh, nonetheless, I thought it was very important for everyone to be able to hear an interview from Dosh because he's such an inspiring person. So even if we had the technical difficulties, I'm glad that we worked through it. And I hope that you will enjoy this conversation. Without further ado, here is AAM Mentor and Paderska Foundation founder, Dosh. Today we have a very special guest joining us from Kampala, Uganda. His name is Dosh. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have been friends with him for a few years now, and I've been following his work. Uh, he, do, he does so much awesome stuff, and I'm really happy to be able to speak with him today. What's going on, Dosh? How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, how about you? Uh, it's a pleasure to have me on here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, man. So I want to get right into it. Um what led you to veganism and animal rights? Um, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, my path to veganism wasn't... It was something that actually I didn't, I didn't realize I was getting into it uh, from the beginning. Uh, because I was raised by poultry farmers. Uh, being raised by poultry farmers means that uh, the only kind of business I knew from from the day one until the age of 24, I think, 24, until, that, until 2018. So 1994 to 2018, um, that's the only thing that I knew. Uh, what the thing that it means, it means that I go to witness all kind of horrible things that farmers do to the animals. Not only that I go to witness, but unfortunately and sadly enough, I was, I was part of the group that did whatever it did to the non humans. Um some of the scenarios I can I can highlight about um that I can remember uh what what we as humans what we do to the animals. I remember that 
other farmers could give uh, could give out of medication to these to these guys and time came that they could lay so much you know because uh of our own ego self interest of profit um birds are given medication because we want so much they have very big e e eggs so by the time the egg the hen gives you know lays its egg it's so big that the intestines can't support so when it pushes out the eggs the intestines come along and some of the farmers what they could just do in case of treatment they could just uh, get ash put on it as and then throw it back and a day hours later i couldn't find it dead because it was poked by the red by the other guys the birds and then another scenario these are the kind of horrible things that we did um was having you know because it's a tradition what we do when we're debating uh, a farmer will get a knife dip it into hot fire and when it's red hot they will slice off the bird's beak you know uh then another then the lastly one i think uh the were horrible one was other uh, instances where the birds are given out of medication because they want them to grow fat and they can't support the weight of their own bodies so you could find this little guy seated down and by the time when they bring food for the into the pallets for them to eat this guy can't move so the rest of the birds are going to move over him until all the farmer sees this guy and brings them closer to the food unless otherwise if that doesn't happen you're going to find birds you know lying all over dead because of their own a weight and hunger now all this piles up you know uh, and i feel like uh, this is not what i'm supposed to do at this time i don't know anything about animal rights i don't know anything about veganism so i started feeling like i wasn't i wasn't doing the right thing because in this time i was in every part of the department we are five siblings and i was the only one who was invested into the family business because poultry farming was the family business and my other siblings were into a uh, non-profit world and so on and accountant financial world so me being into the poultry that means that's all i knew so what happened is that time comes and i feel like i'm start i'm tired of playing god on to walking into the barn and choose which bird is going to be slaughtered that day and which one is not so um the one thing i could say that would be like a major hit or a trigger was we were watching i was with a friend and we were watching some documentaries and it was about the middle east and all that how talibans and blah blah and they were slaughtering off people's heads chopping them off and then i was i was well, i was just jokingly saying to my friend that i don't want to die like that he laughed and i was like yo what's up he was like but that's how you kill the birds you know you, you're saying you don't want to die like that but that's the same kind of end you're giving to the birds mind you he's not a vegan he, he had no idea about veganism and all that so this this hit me and i'm like okay I, i'm not doing this anymore i've i've done i've done enough so I'm, I'm this time I'm like I'm going I'm go I'm quitting I'm not I don't have anything about vegan so I can't say I'm going vegan I was like I'm quitting this I don't want to do this anymore now that same period I'm I'm deciding on quitting the business that's the same time I get to lose my mom and so that was the whole thing was a lot because she was like everything like totally she's she was everything that i knew of anyone that i ever loved so that's the same time i lose my mom and it's the same time i'm stepping out of the family business because now it was me and how i was so much into it so i'm stepping out of the family business i'm losing my mom so i tell my sister i'm, I'm i no longer because by then when i'm when i'm deciding to leave that i'm like i'm not even eating them anymore you know so my sister asks me are you are you vegan i'm like what's that you know because now I'm no longer eating them and I'm not eating them but then I'm consuming eggs and milk so I just I just you know get to search about it and I'm like ah yeah I should say I'm not because I'm not eating this and because vegetarianism actually is more common than vegans vegetarian vegans and because people don't know here vegans they know about and it's anytime I tell someone I don't eat animals the first thing they ask me are you vegetarian so I'm like yeah, but then I tell her no, I'm vegan. She was like, then then she's like, 
because me going vegan i wasn't vegan i was vegetarian and i didn't know so when she tells me that vegans are not supposed to consume milk and eggs that was and after me making then then we were together we got the phone we searched about it and yeah so <clears throat> that 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 was my very fastest any decision i've ever made in my life like it was so fast that i never got to think about it the moment i read about it that vegans don't consume milk and eggs and the fact that i knew i had the background of what we do to to the birds to the egg industry what does to the birds that was the very easy decision for me to make because i knew everything well with with going vegetarian i didn't know because i never had anyone to come up to me and talk to me you know so it was something that i realized and i was like okay this is not something right uh playing good uh choosing on which bird leaves or dies so that whole part uh that's that's my journey basically but there there was there wasn't one one thing that there was never one thing that came to me and I'm like I should go vegan uh those however however there were parts and series of things that came up and piling up piling up until I go to where I am today so yeah that's it yeah i think that's the way it is with a lot of us you know like a lot of us like to point to one single moment and say you know that's when i decided to go vegan but you know really i think it's a lot more complicated than that we all have these experiences from childhood and onward that all kind of lead up to this moment it's kind of like when people talk about that uh 100 point system you know like maybe there's things throughout your childhood and you know movies you watch or you know things like that that each give you a point toward going vegan and then you know when you get the the 100th point so to speak that's kind of when you you know really make that change and decide to you know live in alignment with your morals so how then did you decide to take it a step further what made you want to go from you know uh being involved with this poultry farm business to then being a vegetarian to then being a vegan and now you're taking it a step further by being an animal rights activist what led you to that um well so like like say it's always numbers that makes sense at the end of the day you know a sequence of various scenarios that pile up and then you're like okay i think this this shows something so <clears throat> what happens like um I'm me going vegan. I'm quitting the business. The business is dropping. It's failing. Um it's creating chaos within the family, you know, because now um like the very top that was mom who had passed and then I'm quitting so there's no one left. So that brings chaos within the family because at first they think these are just jokes I usually make, you know, and then they see me I'm getting serious. I'm no longer involved in business and all that. So I and then that I realized now there are animal rights because by then I didn't know there are animal rights and all that. So I have no job, I have nothing that gives me some time on my hands, you know, to do what I want. But at the same time that creates um my mind feels like I need to do something. I need to find a job because I didn't know anything else, you know, because um I went to my university by then I I had just had my bachelor's at it was social i did social sciences and i am i was a psychology major and i mainly did social work but i i was so much invested into poetry i never had a time to go into that kind of world so what happens then is like i need to find a job so i try to look at for a job in the line of my career you know and i feel like i want to know of um, and more rights and all that So I search around and I find that there is no any animal rights organization in the country. You know, and the the first thing that I found around it was anonymous for the voiceless chapter and that was in South Africa. So <clears throat> uh FV gives me the experience of animal rights through re- reading them and reading about their website and what kind of things they do. So this gives me a deeper th- love and the first thing i've never wanted to be employed so 
and i and the fact that me being in the poultry business i was like more of self-employed despite the fact that it was a family business so i i begin to want now i'm like i should do something you know so by then already in the background i ha- i had the organization but it was a loki podushka it was only focusing on the humans but um on getting engaged on my very first av cube i realized that uh av cube they were, yeah they were efficient at the time but even now but the problem was that it was targeting a specific group of people you know the street bypassers people who were so that means i feel like i need to address uh people on an age basis or on a professional basis so i wanted to reach out to people in every corners you know i wanted to bring veganism to them i didn't want people to find veganism because it took me 25 years 26 years to find veganism and if someone had brought it to me early enough you know i would have done better so that's what that's what that's what i was thinking about there now <clears throat> I feel like I need the very first thing after the very first cube I'm like okay I'll sit with my friend and I'm like uh we need we need to do something about this so my very first thing that came to my mind was schools for the kids so I approached my very first school and I'm like hey I'm here and I'm here to talk about veganism and that was a very straight no boom they were like no this is not going to happen I uh, you need to have offices you need to have a certificate you need to have a license blah 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 then I was like because right now I'm in new I'm new into the field of activism I have zero knowledge I'm just you know I'm not, not nothing like experience so what I do I go back home and I'm like how best can I approach these people and <clears throat> this time a time is going by because i think that's what a space of about 3 months i i'm so much invested into the internet with veganism trying to read more and i realize how people don't want to hear the truth there is you know so what i do is that i'm like how best can i approach schools because by then uh, the only idea that i had because of my my personality i'm i'm not really an extrovert um by then because activism has really changed me you know i've learned to speak up i've learned to confront people and also and so on and so forth but by then i was so 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 shy and an introvert at the topmost so at the same time i'm scared because like i remember my very first cube i had more knowledge on veganism than my colleague but i couldn't stand to talk to people in the cube because we were just three so uh, i i i shied off and i had to stand in the cube until my friends forced me because they knew i had more knowledge for me to be they were asking them questions they really never had you know so they could come out of the cube and i could talk so slowly by slowly i gained my confidence so now i'm home i'm like how best can i approach schools i realize that uh the schools uh they have other issues they have other issues and already i have an organization that's that has a license to do whatever it does So I'm like how about I I I bring up something new to talk to people that relates to whatever I want to bring up to veganism. So I I try to look into social justices, injustices in schools and I realize there are things like bullying that no one is minding to speak about, things like depression that no one's minding to speak about, speak about life skills, anti-drug abuse so on and so forth. So I just draft a letter and I go back to the same school and I'm like hey I'm not here to talk about veganism. I'm here to talk about bullying, and this is the organization. The guy gives me green lights. He's like, "Yeah, please, you're welcome." So what I do, I discuss whatever I'm supposed to talk about, the, everything, and I give. So after I've discussed everything I'm talking, I had to talk about. I just play a video, you know, because I didn't know even how to approach them. I was like, I was just going, you know, there's a first time for everything after all. So I just play the video. After playing the video, I ask the kids what. Do you understand by the video? The very first kid that stood up told me that she, the kid has witnessed a person bullying an animal. You know, um, and others. So because the, the, all answers, most of the answers that I got that surprised me, kids had attached the things I told them regarding depression and bullying, and they were attaching it to the animals. 
you know what happens in slaughterhouses so kids were like the animal is depressed the animal is being bullied you know so now that gave me the idea that i shouldn't even bother myself of asking people to talk about vegans in schools let me just you know ask them to talk about this injustices and at the end of the day let me talk about veganism so by the, the by the time that head teacher came into the class when i was talking to the kids it was late and he had no idea about veganism so they ended up paying more attention and they were more curious at the end of the day now i go back home and i decide to emerge my organization with vegans i'm like i'm turning this vegan this organization into a vegan based organization uh so podoshka is a croatian term that means support and you may ask myself yourself why i chose podoshka a croatian language it was i'm a, a soccer fan so it was after the previous world cup where croatia went to the finals with france and no one thought that croatia would we would reach the finals yeah it didn't win but it was the underdog and no one saw it coming through wherever it came through to reach the finals and it's inspired many and i was among them you know because of the vision that i have with, within my my context within my background and the country i am um i i ho- i'm trying to come th- come out through slowly and slowly you know to hit to hit the top not only within my country but as a continent at large basing on the kind of activism that's that's going through so yeah that's how that's how i get into activism uh, because at the end of the day i'm having my i'm putting my degree to use you know with social work and all that and um integrating it with veganism you know and with time i'm i'm getting experience i'm getting more confident i'm speaking out to people i'm i'm finding myself standing up to situations that i never thought i would stand up for my my background my background in the poetry business has made me a better activist you know uh my my because i'm 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 a muslim and my faith as a muslim has also put me in a better position as an animal activist you know so just like you say there are very many scenarios you look at the things that we were using before we became vegans in sorry vegans and now we are using them as tools to promote the animal rights so this is how everything piles up and i feel i have to fight up for the animals because you look at here no one no one does you know people are there that are claiming that they are doing animal rights and at the end of the day it's something else uh all they are doing maybe it's the dogs if they are doing so much it's the dogs and the cats for them and it's nothing about the domesticated real victims i understand that dogs have people who are fighting for them they are animals and yeah they need to be but then there is someone else who's at the edge of their life so basically yeah, that's it yeah i think i think your i think the story of your growth is really powerful because i mean coming from the background you did like on a chicken farm basically or bird farm and then becoming this person who speaks up for everyone i mean it it, it honestly dosh it, it blows my mind everything that you're able to accomplish like i see you putting together these programs for um, women and children, I see you putting together these, uh, programs, uh, you know, uh, for like sports in your community so that children, you know, can have something to do. Um, and all the while, you know, you're instilling these, um, uh, vegan principles in them as a teacher, because you're, you're a leader and you're a teacher. And, um, I think, what you're doing over there is just so incredible. I really don't know how you do it all. Um, and I, it's awesome. It's just awesome what you've been able to accomplish, especially, you know, you said you're kind of like an introverted person that can be really hard to overcome as well. Um, you know, when you have all these ideas and want to make change, but you know, it's, it's tough when (laughs) it's tough sometimes when you're, uh, when you're introverted. Um, so yeah, I just, I just commend you, man, for, 
uh, everything that you've been able to achieve so far. And I mean, you're still going really strong. So what's the government like in Kampala, Uganda? And, you know, does that, how difficult is it to do activism? I guess it probably depends on what kind of activism you're doing, but, you know, do you have any, I mean, I think every country has their own problems with government and, you know, how that affects their activism. But I was wondering if you had any specific challenges um, due to the government in Uganda. Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say really because um, it's a blessing in this guys. Uh, activism is really young. I'm all activism is really young. And it hasn't really shaken the government or the powerful because by the government, basically the powerful rich ones were threatened with it by their... Okay, <clears throat> so by, by the powerful ones, uh, it's basically the government, you know, uh, that are really affected by the threat. But apparently we don't have... I haven't really had any issues with the government uh, because uh, apparently I'm registering as a non-government organization because uh, initially I've been operating as a company limited by guarantee. And I realized that I'm going to start having issues because now I'm growing big and I'm attracting attention. So I realized I need to, I need to have my permit for animals because I recently... And I had an issue with the police and they were like, your permit tells us that you're working with women and children. Why are you doing this for the animals? When it's different from. So I was like, I'm helping people. That's all. Because um, <clears throat> with, my, with my organization, uh, unlike the rest of the organizations uh, dealing in animal rights, uh, we, we ensure productivity. You know, in all our projects, despite us talking about veganism, our projects uh, must be sustainable. We must, must most of them, as 90, 80% of our projects ensure sustainability. Because at the end of the day, we have, we don't want to talk to someone and we find you on the street, we talk to you and then we let you go just like that. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we always like to follow up. So we always want to know, hey, we had a chat with you. I do want to continue this after some time. Can we reach out to you? Can you follow up? You know, uh, the same thing applies to the organ to the to the projects. You look at um, uh, let me say like the lady project where we where we empowering women and girls. Um, we are teaching them on how to make clothes, jewelry within faulty free, faulty cruelty free fabrics. And the thing is, uh, we are telling you that um, you're making a bag out of this. And the reason why you're, you're using cotton or this kind of fabric, it's ABC. And that's why we are not using leather, you know? And another thing is that uh, people, are, when you tell people to go vegan, they're like, hey, but I've, I, I get my income through, through poultry. I get my income through animal agriculture. So we're like, hey, how about we get you a business which you're going to provide market for, for your sustainability? So we get, like they will make their products. We it's our, it's on me to make sure that I find market for their products, and then part of the money is going to go back into the women. Then another one for the organization to develop. So when the government sees that, they're like, "Hey, this is this is what this one is going an extra mile." And now the fact that we are we are registering with the animal ministry with our work because we have hopes of having a sanctuary at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, apparently I would say generally, I don't have any threat from the government because the movement is still young to create that huge shake for everything. Yeah. You were, you were talking a little bit there about, um, you know, people who rely on, you know, killing animals for their, for their income. Um, what challenges have you, you know, faced um, in your outreach, you know, uh, talking with these people, um, I saw, uh, an extremely powerful action that, uh, Paderska foundation did, um, where an activist was actually inside of a cage next to the chickens who were being sold at a live market, um, there. And I thought this was an extremely 
powerful demonstration. And I, I hope that it showed people, you know, like that everybody suffers, you know what I mean? Everyone has the ability to suffer. I, I, I just thought, I thought it was an extremely powerful action. Can you just talk about how that action went and how it was received and, uh, you know, what, what struggles you might've had, uh, speaking with people there or what victories you may have had? Um, yeah. Okay. So basically I, I had that idea. Um, there was, I think this was before COVID. There was a challenge that was moving on about the sea where people were demonstrating and themselves seated in bathtubs, trying to, you know, trying to, I think it was something they were getting, going against the, uh, the, the sea life and all that. So I'm like, how best can I, can I do something similar within the animals on land, you know? How best can we bring out the picture? My my first idea was was to have a movie or kind of a documentary to put up everything, like demonstrate how. Because now in Africa, uh, to be honest, that um, we still are regarding the technology. Most of the rearing of animals that's done is done on our large free range, you know. So factory farming is not that much common in most of the areas. So you find that people are always do their, their on the free range. So my idea was to have a short documentary showing uh, a human versus a non-human, uh, how their life is at the end of, at the beginning, them living freely with the animals and so on. At the end of the day, the human guy is slaughtered and the non-human guy is slaughtered, you know, to bring out the whole free range argument. But then I couldn't have the funds to do whatever I wanted. And I'm like, how best? So I like, let me have, then my other thing was like, how about I create a same challenge that can run globally where everyone is trying to go against that? Because the whole idea was going against um, live markets. You know, they should stop, you know, you should, taking, they should stop taking animals into such markets and all that and so forth. So I'm like, uh, that was so, because I, I was so busy, I forgot to pass it in time for people to come along. So I'm just like, let me just do this, you know. I, I, I had a friend and I'm like, I want to do this and this. Can you help me? He was like, Sh- sure about you. Because he's, he's so much invested into activism. He likes activism a lot. Uh, and unfortunately, due to his work, he's stationed so far, far away that he can't now. So I call him and he's like, yeah, he's going to turn up. So I book, I book a place around... First of all, I had to ensure that the place that I'm booking to sh- to demonstrate I'm known, because we ha- I have security issues. There are, there are instances where we had to pay for security to come and keep us when we was st- when I was still doing every cubes. I had to pay for security to come around, you know, because we were demonstrating close to us a butcher, so I had to have the security. So I go to my home next around my home place, my parents' place where I'm known. And I book for uh, for that cage. I pay for it. I'm like so because everyone was paying for cages, and the history they know that we are we are poultry farmers. They thought that I'm bringing in poultry, but then because some of them are my friends, they're like, "What's happening? You vegan? Why are you doing poultry again?" You know. So they think that maybe I'm failing. I'm going back, and you know. Now, uh, so in the morning that was Christmas. In the morning on Christmas, the idea was to have it, uh, was to have it, uh, Boxing Day, then the night to Christmas, but then I uh, two of my colleagues weren't around, so I we couldn't have that demonstration just two of us, so I had to wait in the morning. So early morning, because that's when the the market gets really full. Uh, people all over a sudden get surprised and they are seeing the someone into the cage instead of poultry. So the whole idea was to show people because one thing I've realized in my in this whole activism thing, I can easily get to people if it's about empathy. You know? And there's no way I could walk I could start talking to people in a live market just like that about activism. You know, they would just see me just like any other guy who's not. So I had to I, I wanted to put my actions, my words into actions and so we get uh we get a cage i had i get my friend into the cage 
and he's like how best can we do this i told him we let's do this as best as we can and the fact that he feels what we're doing what we're standing for it was a swift it was something sweet for us you know so people because i at i had at first when i was beginning like still yeah this is the answer but like i said i'm still an introvert at least i i can't deny that i was afraid to begin the whole thing so i had to act we had to act like we are shooting a movie you know we had to act like it was a movie so people were were there were surrounding and all that and so forth so now uh the only way i realized i could i could start conversations was bringing out the cardboards and chats showing the messages now people as people are seeing now we are bringing out we are bringing out cardboards and they have vegan messages on them now that's when people start asking questions and that's that's what sparks off the conversations you know uh it's going to it's going to always be easy for people to understand what we're talking about if they can see what what we're talking about you know but i can't tell them that uh that that bad has a life has everything yeah many are going to understand but they won't take the next step to what we're trying to achieve but them seeing something similar or close it's always it it's just a direct message that hey we don't belong in cages just like animals don't because that was the main you know we don't belong in cages just like animals don't and we link everything to slavery how slavery wasn't and this is like slavery the same thing you're doing to this human the same thing that you're doing to the animal so we had yeah we had meaningful conversations yes um like any other kind of activism there are those who do it and take the good out of it and there are those who laugh about it generally so yeah basically that was it it was worth an experience and it's something we are looking into doing more again once we have bigger numbers because what i can say is that uh all kind of projects that we are doing we are however much we are still like trying to sample them because of our numbers and we want to do something bigger and better because now uh one thing we've come to realize and this is something that Mikey told me that uh we may not be able to to inspire the community around us at that particular time but we are able to inspire the whole world you know so yeah basically that's it uh, well for what it's worth man you've you've inspired so many here i know that for a fact because i see people share your work i see people supporting your work here and you're an incredible inspiration i think it's i think it's so awesome that despite you know um security concerns and all the pushback from the community you know you were still able to get out there and you know do this action this controversial action because it's like you said you know like especially others in the community that maybe came up through with uh you know so-called poultry farms as well and those who have just been you know partaking in that industry since you know pretty much birth you know it's it's very easy if you see chickens treated that way um you know from the time you're born it's very normalized but you know we're taught to have empathy for our fellow humans and to see a human in a cage like that uh juxtaposed with the animals that you know supposedly we're not supposed to care about I just thought that was um extremely powerful um and I'm so glad that you all did that action. Now, you know, you've you've done some uh intense and uh you know, controversial uh demonstrations like that, but you also do a lot of uh very heartwarming activism which is you know what we already mentioned about you know the programs you put together for women and children in the communities and everything like that um but tell us about what i think is a big part of what you do which is teaching children um you know i've seen some really powerful pictures of you in front of classrooms you know with uh 
vegan messages written on the chalkboard and holding signs with vegan messages teaching, you know, these kids that, you know, they can be vegan and they don't have to harm animals, um, you know, for their lifestyle. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Can you, can you tell me how that message is, you know, received by the kids? Uh, and also, you know, do you have any pushback from parents on this or other people in the community when you're, uh, teaching these kids about veganism and animals? Um, actually, what I'm going to this is this is kind of silly, but it's a good thing. Um, one thing I can say is that when recently, because schools have been closed down for about two years, and we resumed this program about nine weeks, eight about seven to nine weeks back, and we are and to date in the previous two months we have been to about eleven schools, I should say. But one thing that really made me realize that what we're doing is really working out was when I was suspended from a school. And that's when I realized that, okay, whatever we are doing is working. Why? So <clears throat> we go to this school and we are like, hey, we are, like I said, you're here to talk about bullying, blah, 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 and blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, you're welcome. Because I was given short time, and so they were like, we are going to give you only one class. You tell them what you want to talk to them about. And then when you come back next week, we shall give you the rest of the school. And I was like, perfect. And I was given about an hour to talk to the kids. So I realized that this is not going to be enough time to talk about veganism. You know? So I had my friend talk about depression for about, summarized it for about 10 I, I also summarized, so we only talked about depression and bullying. So then, and then I kicked in veganism. And I sometimes, based on the age of the kids I'm talking to, most of the cases I'm direct. I'm direct. I always tell them, you ask your teachers. And I don't mind when the teachers are there or not. I'm like, ask your teachers what the meat is doing. And they're always like, hey, but they're telling us the meat is supposed to be in a balance there and tea and you know, and most cases, cause I like, because I like facts. I always, even I can just Google it there and then, and we find the facts. You know, so what happened is that our kids go back home, because it's a day school, and they are offered meat, and kids refuse to eat meat. And I don't know, I by that so, for me what happens is that every time I'm done, I'm done with a with. With a session, I ask, we go into Q&A and we're done. We take pics, that's all. I leave, you know. I only come back after a while to because I have to create the club. I have to create a vegan club, a bullying club and all that. So we, I come back to make a follow-up on who are the people in the, in the club and how many are they so that we can equip them with the right resources, T-shirts, uh, read uh, T-shirts, and things like my reading material resources and so on and so forth. So what happens now, uh, my colleague who I work with, who is in charge of the school's program, uh, he calls me and, and he's like, we can't go back to this. The school is called St. Joseph. We can't go back to St. Joseph anymore. It's a Christian-based school. And I'm like, hey, we have their program on Fridays. Like they have canceled us. I'm like, why? Because of veganism. I'm like, why? Kids went back and refused to eat food. Parents came to the school and complained. Now the school doesn't want us to go back. And I laughed it off. And he was surprised. I was like, he was like, why are you laughing? We can't go to the kids anymore. I was like, no, that's enough. We have done. You know, these kids have already showed what they want and they're going to take the message further. The fact that they have refused to eat food, meat at home, they're going to, because uh, this was the, the only, the good thing is that they gave us the highest, the oldest kids in the school. So that means that we spoke to these kids and the fact that they stood up to their parents, they are ready to stand up against their fellow kids and speak the message. So <clears throat> that alone made me understand that these kids are really, really picking up the message. Because at the end of the day, you're like, who's going vegan? And you see no hand, you know? And at the end of the day, kids are not eating food at home that has animal products. And parents are coming to the school, are complaining, 
what are you teaching our kids why are you asking them not to eat meat you know and we have parents that <clears throat> we have parents that are that call in you know call in and they're like hey this is interesting you know because uh, uh on on a fact people I, you can never talk about here yeah, with my experience you can never talk about uh animal veganism and the environment and no one is going to bother about the environment um the very first thing they listen to if it's about veganism it's their health and then the animals and then the environment last so um when i hit when i get to when i get to the to the health bit i hit it so hard and the animals bit because that's what they're going to go back and explain to their parents so you find parents calling in fighting and you find parents calling in appreciating you know but in general because they are kids and these things are always learned and unlearned they get to unlearn certain things and they put in this new information you know they put in this new information they process it they process it, they process it right so yeah uh it's i think uh with the kind of activism that you are doing this is the kind of activism that is bring that is targeting a very big numbers because we can go to a school of about a thousand kids a school of about 500 kids you know and more 700 2000 kids and you you're seeing kids coming up uh all i have to do is to make it i have to always ensure that i make it fun you know program it now like uh, because we have just started but uh we want to have a match within the country basing on regions for kids standing up and marching through the city about animal rights and other social injustices in school at the end of it all we have a camp uh to gather all these kids who are vegan and do a camp teach them about veganism more in details with other people around professionals then also um all if all goes well we are going to have a magazine and this magazine is going to be like a vegan activism mouthpiece for the kids where it's going to help kids who are good in art poetry basically literature too so we want to develop that kind of because now africans like it it say that they hate reading so we want to develop that that kind of activism that's through art and poetry you know where kids can write poems can write essays about animal rights and all that can draw so this magazine is going to be consisting of vegan kids in all vegan clubs in schools you have been to where they put their vegan messages into writing and try to inspire so that the book the magazine will will be like will be a form of a form of activism as well that we want to develop for young kids and also other kind of activism within schools because kids are like how can we i'm, I'm a vegan i want to be vegan but how can i help you know and you find they have talent so we are trying we the whole school program thing vegan school program thing is at the end of the day after us talking to them about veganism we want to use their talents to speak up and stand up for animal rights so yeah that's it that that's incredible i know that's a lot of um pushback to have to deal with but just hearing that you know these kids are going home and, you know, telling their parents they don't want to eat animal flesh anymore. I mean, how powerful, you know, I think, I think speaking with kids and educating kids, um, on these important issues is a, is a strategy that's often, you know, very overlooked by our movement um there's so many activists that are kids and they have they they can be so inspirational and you know i think they're a whole lot smarter than a lot of adults give them credit for um you know and uh, man i'm i'm just really excited to uh hear about that when you when you said that the uh, the parents were calling the schools <laughs> saying my kids don't want to eat meat anymore <laughs> like i i that's so awesome. I know it sucks to have to like deal with the parents and, you know, figure out how you're going to keep doing this kind of activism sometimes, but just to hear that a change is being made and to hear that you're impacting the lives of these kids who, you know, have decided that they want to live more compassionately because as kids, you know, 
at least for me, like I didn't really feel like I had a choice. You know, I didn't know that there was a choice. You know what I mean? And you're empowering these kids by letting them know that there is, uh, there are consequences to the actions of humans and you're giving them the opportunity to, you know, do what they think is best. And a lot of times, you know, parents and adults take those opportunities away from children or shield children from that. And, you know, in some instances that's appropriate, but in instances like this, I think a, a, a kid just like anybody else should be able to follow their conscience. Um, yeah, that's, that's also powerful, man. Um, so you were talking earlier, you know, you, uh, you provide, um, you know, like essential products for people in your community who need them, uh, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but you also do these like big, uh, vegan meals for groups of people. Um, how big of a part of your activism is that? Like how, how accessible is healthy vegan food, uh, in Kampala and, you know, do people rely on you to help, help them find that food or is it pretty easy to find and you're just kind of educating them about it? Like what's that whole situation like? Um, so to begin with, I think um, first and foremost, the food is everywhere. Let's let's first ignore the hunger issues and the starvation that's happening across the country and the world at large. But uh, plant-based food is the cheapest food you can find here in Uganda, in Africa. You know, <clears throat> uh, with with a dollar, you can buy ten mangoes, thirty mangoes. You know, uh, you can buy with a dollar. With a dollar, you can buy over ten avocados. With a dollar, you can, you know, you can buy amounts of veggies. The problem is the nutrition transition where people are getting financially stable and they feel that um, the veggies are for the broke people. The veggies are for people who can't, who can't afford meat. This is like my experience. I had, um, at one time I was in a restaurant with my friends and then this walks in my other colleague who didn't know I was vegan. And he finds me having a vegan meal and my other colleagues weren't. And he's like, yo, Dash, let me pay for you. Let me buy you chicken. Why are you eating veggies? You know, because he thought that I couldn't afford the meat. I'm broke to have veggies. So uh, this is what happens. Um, like I personally, I started boarding school when I was six years until 17. So meaning that I spent entirely my whole life because at school, in boarding schools, the common meal served its beans and maize flour. So, I find a kid out of school. So, uh, you find someone is going to leave boarding school because boarding schools are so, so common here, very much common. I find that as a kid is going to leave boarding school at the age of 18, and you meet this kid at the age of 20, 22, and you're talking to them about veganism, and they're like, what else can I substitute for meat? And you tell the beans, they're like, ew, I'm not having beans. I, I literally had beans. That I've been having beans for all my entire life. So uh, the fact that people are attaching, they attach, the, that's a problem because now they feel like they only rich, I can only be rich if I eat chicken or, you know, they want to, they want to show status, their financial status. So this is kind of like a hard, a, a, a problem. But other than that, our food, our food programs, we have basically three kind of food programs. One food program doesn't really, doesn't really do much. That's a compassionate feeding program. Doesn't involve a lot of talking about veganism because it is, it's specifically uh, targeted for the homeless or people who can hardly attain a meal on the streets. So for them, we only talk to vegan about veganism if their questions ask like, why aren't you giving us meat? Why aren't you giving us chicken? We are like, hey, we are a plant-based organization. We are a vegan-based organization. That's why we know it. But uh, we have what we call the school feeding program. And apparently uh, we've been having an organization called Magic Mabel that uh, supported us until the next two weeks. Um, so this school program, it we apparently, uh, we were feeding 200 meals a day 
and when we got external support from magic mabel foundation uh, th our numbers doubled to 400 meals each day that means we give out 2000 meals a week so with this what happens is that we have two schools that we feed and these schools don't have any meal that they were giving to kids before so kids could and there, of course there are still very many schools of the same caliber so kids come to school because even at home parents can't afford feeding them so they come to school to learn and they spend the whole day hungry so we realize that um how can we help such let's give them plant-based meals but before we do that we have to talk to the school administration tell them why we are helping and our am ambition is that we are vegan based and we we as collaborating they are supposed to give us a platform to talk to the kids and the, the rest of the stuff about animal abuse and all that and then so yeah that's one we have also the vegan feeding program now the vegan feeding program is like the whole general where we give out that entails us giving out raw food to families to very big huge families where we give them plant-based meals and but these families have places where they can cook their own food unlike the compassionate feeding program so the compassionate feeding program goes to families that can hardly attain or have even places where to cook their food so for them we give them already cooked food that's warm and also we talk to them at the same time so our programs we have various and a variety of vegan feeding programs and the main thing is like i said not only the feeding program but each and every kind of program that we have is vegan backbone it has a foundation of veganism you know, at, at whatsoever, be it project, be it what, we always have to tell people why we are doing this project and why it's quality free. So basically, yeah, that's it. Wow, that's that's a lot of meals and a lot of work that you're just doing constantly. That's uh, that's such great work that you're doing. You're you're making such a such an incredible impact in your community, like finding the needs that need to be met and helping them find those needs and educating them as to why it's being done that way um and you know not harming animals in the in the process i think that's such a beautiful thing dosh um i can't express that enough honestly um so what advice do you have for brand new activists i mean you're an activist that just seems to do it all you know you're you're helping humans, you're helping uh, non-humans. Uh, I, I, I'm honestly not sure how you do it all. So what advice do you have for people who are just getting into animal rights and you know other uh, social justice uh, activism and uh, empowerment? Um, I don't know, but uh, best thing on me and what I do is that the question I always ask myself is, if not me, then who? You know, that's because uh, sometimes like I have my friends who are young activists and I'm like, I'm like, there are projects I feel like maybe I'm tired and I'm not going to get involved and I'm like, hey guys, you handle this project, uh, let's go, you go talk to this school and let's do this. And then maybe sometimes you find that sometimes they've messed up and maybe they haven't done the right thing, you know? So the whole, so I ask myself, such things are like, then if not me, who? So that means that um, I'm, I'm the person who's supposed to do it and numbers matter. You know, I can't do this. I can't do what I do alone, however much I want. I can never do it alone. So numbers matter and the confidence and all that like my fellow introverts you know it's it's always hard at the very first time you know but like every time you keep moving things get better by experience so let's it's not about us let's not give up and one other thing is us keeping our mentors mental heads up like mentally because as as new activists uh, let me tell you, new activists have more urge of animal activism than us. You know, they have they have a lot of love. Well, right now, um, I had I had like their their minds are so fresh with ideas. 
their minds are soft because they are new in the system so they are always they're like the burning frame you know and like people have stayed long so and that means that they give in a lot of energy a lot of power and they forget their own mental health mental status you know like they they forget that someone can say no in their faces and you find someone else because this is out of experience my friend one time uh she was talking to someone about veganism and it was her new first time and then someone said no to her face and like i'm going to still do this and she got mentally but up like she was mentally disturbed for a whole week crying all over you know so i want the, all i'm saying is that we need to know what we are into and that our own health matters and most importantly that is that we are planting the seeds we may not live to see the day you know but then we are going to make a better world for for the for the young generation that's going to come up so it's us to do the work it's us to do the work so yeah that's it wow yeah well thank you so much for joining the podcast today dosh and you know inspiring us all um i'm going to put all the ways that people can support uh your work and paderska foundation i'm going to put that in the description of uh the podcast so that people can check that out is there anything else that you want to add before we wrap it up um i would like i'd like to shout out to animal activism mentorship uh to tre uh, thank you so much because i you you're one of the people who have been supporting us from the very moment um also i want to thank animal activism mentorship once again for the platform because um me being a mentor means i've met different mentees i've met different people and we have I've learned a lot from the platform from the movement it's been a great experience um i want to i want to shout out all people who have been standing there for us our magic mebo foundation our welfare world food for life global the sentient project um lisa all the volunteers who are helping us international level because um one thing when people see the the our website and what we do uh people think that we are a very big organization and when they come on ground and they realize that this is just work done by a team of four people they are always surprised and and by the way, that thing some people have even refused to donate to us because they think we are a very big organization but we are not because of the work of the international volunteers that we have and the local volunteers i'm so grateful for each and every one of my team uh from uk usa and all over and the country thank you so much well dash i think i speak for probably everyone listening when I say thank you for all the work that you do. I mean, you're really, really putting in the work. I see it all the time, and I'm so thankful uh, for all the work you do. Not only, not only are you helping the animals, not only are you helping the people in your community, but you're creating a ripple effect where the people who see what you do um, are inspired. Uh, and I know, I know I'm one of those people who's so inspired by what you do. And I know that there's so many others and, uh, you know, I'm thankful that we're in animal activism mentorship together. I'm thankful that I've been able to follow your work for a few years now and, uh, thankful, uh, that you're my friend as well. And yeah, I can't wait to see what else you do in the future, man. Thanks so much for being on the show today. The pleasure is mine, brother. The pleasure is mine. Thank you all so much for listening. Dosh is just <laughs> absolutely incredible. I said it a couple of times throughout the episode, but I really just don't even understand how he's able to do everything that he does. He's so uh, inspiring of a person. He has such an impact on his community, and he's so humble at the same time. Um, I'm, I'm just in awe of everything that he does. Um, if you look at the description of the podcast, you can find ways to donate to Dasha's work there. 
that money will go to great things as you just heard. So if you have the financial ability to do so and feel called to do so, please check out Paderska Foundation and Dasha's work. And uh, if you can donate, please do. Um, Please also rate and review this podcast. It helps others find it more easily. And the more people that find it, the more people can be inspired by our guests like Dosh that are interviewed on the show. And we can turn that inspiration into actionable change for the animals. If you enjoy the Animal Liberation Hour and would like to support our work at Animal Activism Mentorship, you can consider joining our Patreon for as little as $2 a month if you're able to do so. Uh, This goes such a long way in helping us grow the animal rights movement through mentorship. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship, where you can keep up with the podcast as well as everything AAM. One more reminder that you can sign up for a free mentor to help you with your activism at animalactivismmentorship.com. If you needed a sign that you should be an activist for animals, this is it. I also want to remind you about some of our upcoming uh, in-person events that Animal Activism Mentorship is hosting. On July 29th through August 7th, we will be having the AAM Chicago Convergence 2022. That's 10 days of action against the fur industry, and we're going to be taking action uh, against animal agriculture as well. And then also coming up, we have the Ohio Occurrence in Cleveland, and that'll be outreach, demos, protests, and other uh, actions. That's Friday, September 2nd through Sunday, September 4th. So three days of action for the animals. In the description, I'll include Animal Activism Mentorship's link tree, which has the links to the event pages and fundraisers and um, registration forms for these events. Uh, You do have to register to come to these events. So please check it out. We would love to see you in Chicago and in Cleveland. Uh, These events are great opportunities for activists to come together for the animals, especially if you're a new activist and you would like some guidance and you'd like the chance to be able to do some activism uh, under the wing of an expert activist. You can have the opportunity to do that. So the Chicago Convergence and the Ohio Occurrence, I'll put the link to the link tree in the description. So check that out. Also, remember you can check out our workshops. You can check out our other podcast episodes. We've got so much going on. You can find it all in our link tree uh, and at animalactivismmentorship.com. Remember that it will take all of us to achieve animal liberation. Stay focused, stay positive, be effective, and keep doing your part. Until next time.